Hello and welcome to the five tips when introducing Microsoft Flow and Power Apps to your organization or customers session. It is part of this MVP Days conference, online conference. I want to thank John Levesque, Gabe, and Dave Koala for organizing this. I think this is a really great opportunity to interact with the community and build some unique content from people across the globe and be able to stream this all online and to be able to respond to questions on Twitter in real time. So feel free if you do have questions, I will be online during when this is recording is being played. You can at me at Weirzy, um, but happy to answer any questions as we go through this. So what is this talk about? So this talk is about governance and talking about how we're going to apply rigor in order to prevent unintended consequences. So as you can see here, there's a picture of a bowling alley and we've got bumpers that are existing in the gutters. And the idea is to keep the ball in play. And certainly this is one of the big concerns that a lot of organizations have. And certainly when I was at Microsoft, I was chatting with a lot of large organizations around governance and some other concerns. And certainly I think the, the core concept is that I think generally IT departments do want to help. They do want to enable their business to do more, but they're concerned about the risks. They're concerned about the downside of giving too much power to end users. And I think there's a, a happy medium that can be struck. And I think this is part of the focus of this talk where we're going to use governance and some techniques in order to make our business users productive, but still giving us some comfort knowing that they're not going too far or out of bounds or in the gutter. So security is another aspect. So security is really preventing unauthorized or unsanctioned activities from occurring. Another concept, and this was something as we were going through a lot of the governance sort of strategies and tooling at Microsoft, this was one thing that surprised us a little bit. And the visibility that we're gonna show you in terms of how you can understand what your users are doing can use for more than just governance and can be used for more than just say cybersecurity and audit. It can also be used from an organizational change management perspective. Now, maybe you're not familiar with that term. It's also known as OCM. And really what this is driven from is as more and more technology is introduced into the enterprise, there are people generally that are put into these roles and their role is to really embrace technology educate end users and really show them how they can leverage technology to get greater business outcomes. Now I've seen this oftentimes with Office 365 and part of this was around Office 365 would roll out new services and IT departments may get frustrated because we haven't even had a chance to look at this technology yet we've got users now using this and perhaps even contacting the service desk. And so this is important from a flow and power apps perspective is actually identifying who are your champions and really identifying how are they using these technologies and how can you actually embrace that and actually get them to do more and actually get more value. So this is another lens that we're going to take a look at as we go through this specific talk. And so why, why this talk? Why am I choosing to, to do this talk? Well, there's a few different reasons. Naturally, when I was at Microsoft, this was an area of focus for me, um, so I'm pretty passionate about it. But I would say, in addition to that, you know, I've since joined a, a new organization, a, a customer organization, and so we don't have Flow or Power Apps, or at least not prior to me getting there. So certainly, I understand the value of Power Apps and Flow, and what are the opportunities having seen some very successful and innovative companies adopt Flow and Power Apps while I was at Microsoft. And certainly I want to bring those opportunities to my organization, but on the flip side, I'm also aware of some of the challenges or some of the concerns that other organizations have had with a powerful tool like this. And so I think it can bring some pretty good perspective from, you know, from a Microsoft perspective and some of the things that we thought about when I was there. And then now on the customer side and say like, is this really important to me? Do I really need to do this? And if so, why? And what's the benefit? And I think that's the, the unique opportunity with this talk is that I can bring both of those perspectives. So let's go ahead and dive into this. 
So let's talk a little bit about fear. Naturally, flow and power apps, they're very powerful tools. And some IT groups feel they're losing too much control by putting these tools in the hands of end users. Generally, I'd say the main concern is related to data exfiltration. So what that means is really unintended data leaving your organization and going to a, another organization. Now that could be a consumer-based service like a Twitter or a Dropbox or a Box, or it could be to a competitor or it could be someone who's left the company and their account's still active and they're sending data to their new company. And regardless of the scenario, it is something you don't want to have happen. People spend a lot of money trying to protect the enterprise and certainly we don't want to exfiltrate data. Naturally, IT groups haven't had a chance to certify the tool and don't want end users to get ahead. And so this was an interesting comment and I, I'll be honest, I never really thought about it in this way, but it does make sense. When you think about the office waffle, so really that's the three lines, and this isn't so much a concern anymore because Flow is now like a, a second click away, but generally when you would click on the waffle, you'll see all of the Office 365 services that are available. And some of the concerns are, well, if an icon shows up there, that's really like the IT department giving someone permission to go ahead and use the tool. And so this is a concern for folks, is that if they haven't had a chance to certify the tool, people are gonna use it, and if they get stuck, where are they gonna go? They're gonna to go to the service desk. And then the IT group may not be in a position to service them, which creates a lot of friction and concerns and angst. And so, so this is a problem, but I would also encourage IT departments is you are considered to be the innovation engine of an organization. You do need to find ways to get ahead of this because I'm telling you right now, if you don't get ahead of this, it's going to be way harder. And certainly from my perspective, joining this new role, the, one of the first things I'm doing is actually implementing governance, really the tools and techniques we're gonna talk about in this presentation so that I can get ahead of things because it is way more difficult to pull a tool away from someone than to really provide those bumpers, as I showed you in the previous slide, before people can actually get their hands on the tool. So it is better to be proactive, it's best for everyone. And a lot of organizations would prefer to just bury these tools, let's be honest. They, they just wanna make it go away, but once again, it's the wrong attitude. It's, you know, those organizations won't be competitive. And I think nowadays, the organizations that do are gonna win, they're gonna win because they've been able to get on this treadmill of technology and they've been able to stay there. And that's key. This is where I want you to be at the end of this talk, where you're ahead, you're in the driver's seat, you have the opportunity to influence, you have the opportunity to actually bring more value to your organization, but it comes down to whether or not you choose to accept that road trip. But I'm here to give you the tools so that you can accept that road trip and you can lead your users to a great experience. All right, so five tips, let's get into it. Now, you're gonna see some, some themes here and I'm a big fan of the NFL Network and they always do these countdowns and they naturally do the countdowns with people wearing the, play, the jersey of the number that they're on. So I'm also a big Arizona State fan. They've recently beaten the University of Arizona, their arch rival in the Territorial Cup and are on their way to the Las Vegas Bowl. So to celebrate their season, we're gonna go with this Arizona State theme. And we're gonna start with number five. So not only are you gonna learn about power apps and flow, but you're also gonna learn about ASU football. So this is uh, the quarterback senior, and this is Manny, Manny Wilkins. And uh, so he's just kept up a great year. And so we're gonna start with environments, courtesy of Manny. So environments, what are environments? Environments provide isolation between apps and flows. And so what you can almost think about this as is, you know, your typical enterprise IT scenarios, you got a dev environment, you have a test environment, a production environment. And the purpose of these is that you have isolation. So that if you make a change to a dev environment, it doesn't have an impact in the test environment and so forth. You can think of environments in the same manner where we have the ability to isolate different flows and power apps and choose to provide different say versions or have just different functionalities. And there's a, a few different reasons why you may want to construct environments and we'll, 
We'll get into that in a little bit more detail here shortly. Data loss prevention policies can be applied to individual environments or tenants. So we're going to talk a little bit more about that in an upcoming slide. But data loss prevention is really preventing connectors from talking to each other if you don't want them to. So for example, if you do not want to have, say, SharePoint Online and Twitter in the same flow, what you can do is create a DLP policy that prevents that. Now this is a question that comes up and it's highly contested or it's highly um, sensitive for some organizations. And this is, if you are a licensed user of PowerApps or Flow, you have maker rights inside of the default environment. Now the default environment is what it sounds like. When you go ahead and provision the service and you sign into Flow or you sign into PowerApps, what's happening is an environment is getting provisioned for you under the hood and this is what's called the default environment. And as part of this, every single user that's licensed, it has access to this environment to create flows or to create power apps. Now you can create non-default environments. So these can be created by P2, P2 users where you have either, either purchased that license or you've signed up for a trial you can go ahead and create non-default environments. Now with non-default environments, you do have more control around permissions. So you can opt in specific users to have that maker privileges in non-default environments. We'll talk about this on the next slide, why that might be important. Also note that the on-premises data gateway can only be created in one environment. So currently this lights up in the default environment but it can be changed with a support ticket. So not super broadly known, but it definitely is possible if you create a support ticket, but do know you can't have multiple on-premises data gateways. You can still have one, but you can choose which environment it belongs to. So let's take a look at a sample configuration. And this is essentially what I've done at the new place. I've created or I've modified the name of the default environment to be called personal productivity. Now, as part of that, I want to enable people to be able to explore and to build within that environment. Subsequently, I've also created two other environments, a test environment and a production environment. And there's good uses for, for these environments. This is really when we want to build these apps that need to be managed. Perhaps they need to go through change control. Perhaps you want to restrict access to who can go ahead and create or use those apps. We can actually start to get into the, the finer permissions uh, by using this sort of approach. So in summary, a personal productivity environment, we want to build flows and apps for personal usage. So when my boss emails me, send me a push notification, that's where it would live. You might want to connect to non-SOC systems. So perhaps SharePoint Online, you want to do a very simple approval inside of say a team site that you own. No problem, go for it. Open publishing rights, no problem. It's available, go, go ahead and use it. But if you wanna build corporate apps or apps that have SOX implications, so the Sarbanes-Oxley um, requirement or regulation, you need to have some more change control around those types of apps. So this is where you wanna restrict that access and set expectations around using test and prod environments so that you don't have users inadvertently pushing changes to a production app without going through change control because that could be an audit issue. And so this is sort of the purpose of using, you know, a test environment and a prod environment. When it comes to tests, there's looser change control because you don't have to go through change work for those. So you may want to limit the publishing rights through management connectors. I'm going to show you a strategy around that here shortly but generally you'll leave it a little bit more open. You get to production, naturally you want a little bit tighter change control. So you might say, hey, only these people are allowed to publish apps to the production environment. Using the management connectors, you could actually enforce that by looking for new apps, seeing if they're part of a group, and if they're not part of the group, you could go ahead and delete the app or remove the permissions. So you have the choice with these management connectors, you really control your own destiny. Now let's go and see a very short demo. So in this flow, what I wanna be able to do is I want to remove unauthorized environments. Now we chatted about it before, 
that if you're a P2 license holder, you can go ahead and create environments. But there's really no good reason to start creating additional environments. All you're doing is creating sprawl and you don't need it. You don't need to have 100 environments. It doesn't make sense. It becomes more difficult to manage, more difficult to apply DLP policies, and it just gets messy. So why bother? Let's go ahead. We're going to establish specific environments. We're going to create an Office 365 group that will contain group members that have the authority to create the uh, environments. And so what I've done here is I've built a flow and this is going to run on a schedule. It doesn't really matter. Every two hours could be every day, which is more likely what I'll do with this. And we're going to go ahead and use the management connector. So this is the power platform management connector. And we're going to go ahead and get all of the environments. We'll also go ahead and get the group members for this specific group, which I'm just calling Power Platform Environment Creators. Next, what we'll do is we'll go ahead and we will loop through each of the environments. Now, there is a subtle difference with the default environment where it doesn't have the user principal name or UPN of a user that created the environment. It's basically a system account inside of Microsoft that created that. So we're essentially gonna do a check just so that we exclude that. Now, what we're gonna do here is we are going to go ahead and check to see if the user principal is in the permit list. And how we're gonna do that is we're basically gonna get the, group, the list of group members from 0365, we're gonna convert it to a string, and then we're gonna see if it contains this user principal name that actually created this specific environment that we're on. And then what we're gonna do is if we find one, we're gonna go ahead and send an email saying, hey, so-and-so, we see you've created this Power App or Flow environment called Foo, and we're giving you 24 hours to go ahead and export those assets and move it to another environment. And if you don't, we're gonna go ahead and remove them. The next thing we can do is create a delay. Now for the purpose of this presentation, we're gonna delay for a minute. Generally, this will be set to a day. And then what we're gonna do is we're going to create this approval. And in this case, it's gonna get sent to myself. It's gonna give me information about the environment who created it, the UPN so I can follow up with them and ask more questions. And then what'll happen is if I click on the approve button, we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna delete this specific environment. Now do note, and this is very important, you need to change the API version to this value, 2018-0101, because there has been an API change and you can't use the default API version to delete CDS environments. So we're gonna go ahead and use this. Also note that it looks like there's a bit of a race condition. So I have gone ahead and configure run after here um, to basically say failed or succeeded because there is a bis uh, an error that'll get thrown back, which isn't really an error because the environment does get deleted. Uh, so I have reported that it's a little bit odd, but uh, this does work. Once the environment's deleted, we'll go ahead and send the email. So I'm gonna go ahead and we're gonna go ahead and run a test now. So here we are, we're in the flow uh, admin center and we can see we've got three different environments here. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna log in with a separate account, this is my admin account. And I'm gonna log in with another account where I have a P2 trial. I'm gonna create an, uh, an environment and then we're gonna run the process that'll go ahead and clean it up. And now what we'll do is we'll head over to our flow and we're gonna run the flow. And let's see what happens. So here we go. We can see that our flow has kicked off and has detected that an environment has been created called Flow Online Conf. And it's warning me to go and clean up any of my artifacts. And if I don't do that, this thing's gonna get deleted. So we will, uh, right now it's basically in this delay shape and we should be getting an approval here shortly for me as the admin to go ahead and delete this environment. Okay, here we go. We have this approval in my inbox and we can go ahead and approve this. And when we approve this, we're going to see that this environment gets deleted. So let's hit approve, confirm, flip over to admin. And sure enough, we can see that this environment is now gone. And you saw it before, it was there. Um, so this process has essentially gone ahead and cleaned that up. All right, tip number four, DLP policies, courtesy of Demario Richards. 
So DLP policies, they limit what connectors can be used with each other in an app or flow. You have two data groups, business and non-business. And what this allows you to do is any connectors that are grouped in business can communicate with each other. Any connectors that are grouped together in non-business, they can talk together. You can't talk across these different buckets or these different data groups. Now, there is a misconception. You're not disabling connectors when you put them into these different data groups. You are just saying, what are the connectors that each group can talk to? By default, everything shows up in non-business, which means everything can talk to each other. Now, do note multiple DLP policies can be applied to an environment. You can layer them on top of each other. And basically, the sort of most restrictive policy wins. So I bet you didn't know this, but you can actually create a DLP policy where you put a single connector in. And what that means is only that connector can talk to itself. Bet you didn't know that. So for example, you could go ahead and create a DLP policy and you only put Twitter in say the business data group. What that'll mean is only Twitter can talk to itself. So you could not take SharePoint and have it talk to Twitter. It'll only talk to itself. Now use environments to isolate different scenarios. So this might be a justification for another environment, which is okay. So for example, you may not want to have your social media connectors, you know, in your, your sort of default environment and have them talking to some of your business tools like Office 365. But for a corporate communication function, that's perfectly normal. So what you might do is say, I'm going to create an environment just for corporate communications. I'm then going to relax my DLP policy and allow Twitter to talk with, say, SharePoint Online. And I'm going to do this because I'm going to trust that group. And I'm also going to restrict who has access to this group. Now, do note, related to custom connectors, they are managed as part of the default data group. They don't show up by default. So you won't see an icon there. So what that means is if non-business data is your default group, if you have a custom connector, it'll, it'll be put in there. Now this is, is supported and I'm going to let the product team go ahead and, and produce more documentation around this, but you can actually add a custom connector to a DLP policy through PowerShell or the management connectors. I've done it. Um, it does exist. I'll let the product group share more details about that. Moving on to tip number three, this is Eno Benjamin, a sophomore. Now, in this case, management connectors, uh, the flow management connector's been around for probably about a year. What we did earlier in the spring, I guess summer, we, we added some additional management connectors around the power platform, so common assets or common functions like environments. DLP, they show up in power platform. We also have power apps. So Power Apps Admin and a Power Apps Maker Management Connector. And then we have something, the existing flow, which is sort of a hybrid of admin and maker functions. And we also have the flow admin for admin related functions. These connectors are extremely powerful. And in this presentation, what I want to talk about is this leftmost template that was published that allows you to get a list of new Power Apps flows and connector. So now you've got visibility into what is being created in all of your different environments. So what you can do is you can browse to your templates, do a search for flow management, go ahead and click on this specific template. It's very straightforward in terms of how you would provision this. Really all you need to worry about is what is the time frame or the window that you want to be able to look back on. Now for some people they want to run this every day so their window is essentially going to be just one day. So this is their reporting period. By default, it's seven. So what this will do is this will run every day and it'll look back seven days and then it's going to go through every environment and look up any new flows for that environment. So we're going to check the date. If we find one, we're going to go ahead and append it to an array. We'll do something similar for the connectors. So new connectors put into an environment and we'll do something similar for Power Apps. And what we'll do is we'll have three arrays at the end of the day, and we will go ahead and aggregate those arrays, and we will send them an email based upon the profile. So this is going to get the person who's created that flow, their profile, 
and it's going to basically send you an email. So let's take a look at what that email contains. So here it is here, we can see the environment, in this case, personal productivity. We can see the different flows that have been created, who created them, the flow ID, the creation time. If we would have had any power apps created in the last seven days, in this case, we don't have any, they would show up here, similar information, name of power app, who created it, timestamp, environment, etc. We also can now see connectors, right? So these are connectors that have been deployed in the last seven days. We could also look for update time, but in this case, we're focusing on created time. So we can see things like the Cloud App Security app from Microsoft, Windows Defender, ATP, WebEx Teams. So now we've got this insight. So for example, if we wanted to be able to manage our DLP policies, we can go ahead and do that by seeing what new connectors have appeared. We'll know that they show up in our default data group. If we want to move them up into our uh, basically business data group, we can go ahead and do that. Now we've got this visibility. We also can see who's creating these flows and power apps. And from a change management perspective, this is also important. So next up, number two, Mike Bercovici, former quarterback. For this one, we're going to talk about Office 365 security and audit. Now from a flow perspective, there are audit events that show up in the Office 365 Security and Compliance Center. And what you can do, and I'm not going to go through it in the interest of time here, but I have a full blog that I wrote previously on the flow blog where you can get all of the details around this. And the purpose of the blog is to actually to demonstrate how you can create web hooks against the Office 365 Security and Compliance data, and then actually use that data to actually enforce additional government governance using the management connectors. So for example, if we wanted to know if someone is, is using an action that we don't want, perhaps it's the forward email action, we actually can go ahead and look for those events in Office 365, determine if that action is used inside of a flow definition, send an approval and choose to go ahead and disable that flow. So this is more of an advanced pattern, but it's highly useful and really can address any gaps that you perceive in the existing governance story. So it becomes very powerful. Check out the blog. I think you're going to find that it's very useful and very powerful. Now, last up, analytics, Nikhil Harry. Now, analytics. There's two forms of analytics, admin analytics and maker analytics. Maker analytics naturally shows up in the maker portal. You do need P2. You also need P2 for admin analytics. Now, from a requirements perspective, and we're going to focus on admin analytics, you do need, you do need tenant admin. That will change. The team is working on that. You do need a P2 license. You also need to have explicit environment admin rights. So that means you need to go into the old portal and go ahead and add your tenant admin user account to the admin group in order to have access to see it in the portal. This will change, it will get simpler. Uh, I know the team is working on it. All right, so here I'm in the Power Platform Admin Center, so admin.powerplatform.microsoft.com. I'm gonna go ahead and click on Analytics. Now, we're gonna focus on Flow for today because we don't have any Power Apps in this environment yet. But what we're going to do here is we're going to see the personal productivity environment and we're going to see all of the different usage. Now this is a new tenant. So in terms of usage, uh, it's still sort of a, an evolution here. Here we can see the different flows that are running. If we've had failed flows, we now we can see different trending uh, for based on the day, the week or the month. We can see usage. So these are the types of flows that are in use whether they be event driven, scheduled, or button clicked. And we can also see the name of the flow and how many times it has been run. Another one is errors. This is a common concern for organizations is they don't want to have flows that are just erring out and you know basically wasting resources. So this is a way where you can detect some of the flows that are having some significant issues I do know that the team is working on some additional uh, fields here where you can capture or see who is the owner of those flows so that you can proactively reach out to them. Now, this is probably the most popular and most sought after report, and that is around our connectors. So we can see the different types of connectors 
that are in use here. And we can see things like Office 365, email, RSS feeds, the flow push, wonder list, users, flow management, SharePoint Online, forms, Yammer, etc. Now, if you had some consumer connectors being used, at least you'd get some visibility into this. So in summary, get ahead of your users. It's very difficult to remove tools, but proactively establish your policies. Use environments to segregate workloads. I gave you that example of, de of test and prod, but we also talked about business unit isolation like corporate communications. Now, Microsoft wants to empower admins much like end users. So you do have that powerful tool. You have these management connectors. We didn't really talk about it much, but you also have PowerShell. As an admin, you can do a ton with this platform. Embrace it and be productive yourself. And lastly, leverage analytics data as part of your OCM practice. Identify champions, empower them. And much like good cybersecurity hygiene, flow and power apps education is required too. Talk to your users about the do's and don'ts. And um, I think if you do that, you'll be well on your way to providing a safe and productive environment for your users.